then look at the history of housing within New Zealand, look at some current issues as well as the limitations of some current responses, and then propose a few uh, solutions. So first of all, housing is really important here in New Zealand because it's so key to our economy. Whatever happens within that housing impacts our economy and whatever happens within the economy impacts housing. 
So where we're, where we're at at the moment, a housing price crash will probably more or less decimate our economy. And um, there is a possibility of that happening. It, um, housing can create systemic stability within capitalism as well. Um, David Harvey, the geographer, has pointed this out, that the housing boom post-World War II helped to stabilise capitalism in many ways because a lot of people suddenly had these big houses that they needed to fill with products and goods. So um, it was very good for consumption and um, higher home ownership can create a more stable economy. It doesn't always have to be that way as well. Other economies different from New Zealand do have low lower um, home ownership rates. Now within New Zealand, it, um, housing is embedded within our culture, in particular the Kiwi dream and the idea of home ownership. So, um, yeah, the this has changed over time. It really began with the quarter acre standalone property. What's happening these days is we're seeing a lot more condensed housing within urban areas. You'll see this happening a lot within Christchurch, a lot of two bedroom units going up all over the show. Um, so it is changing this, this version of the Kiwi Dream, but I'd say it still exists where there's a very strong desire to own your own home. The other thing about uh, housing and why it's so important is that it does create divisions and it perpetuates inequalities. There are divisions between um, those who own property and those who rent, how they experience the economy, how they're able to build savings throughout their lifetime, um, whether they have control of their environment as well. Um, but that's not to say that anyone who owns a home has automatically got this stability. Uh, we're seeing interest rates go up at the moment. We had a massive earthquake here about a decade ago, which was not great for the homeowners. Um, but, but there is that diff, uh, competing interest can occur. So for example, first home buyers want to see the market crash. Uh, people who have recently bought a house don't want to see that happen. So it does create these, these divisions. Now next, just continuing with why housing is an important issue, I just want to introduce a couple of concepts. And uh, the first one's ontological security and the second one's alien, uh, residential alienation. Both of these concepts can be found in the book by um, David Madden and Peter Marcuse. That book is called In Defense of Housing, The Politics of Crisis. It's a really interesting book. Um, and I do recommend it. So ontological security, this is about the continuity of identity, which is fostered through your material and social environments. And a home can provide ontological security because it's the physical space in which people perform their daily routines. A home provides privacy from an otherwise intrusive world. And a home is one of the key sites through which people um, through which people construct their identity. So this is looking at our psychosocial relationship with our material environment around us. And, and if anyone's had housing insecurity or housing instability, you'll know how destabilizing it is to you and, and it can really ruin your life in many ways. Um, now with residential alienation, that, that book by Madeline and Marcuse, um, in, de, in Defense of Housing, they, they have a whole chapter on residential alienation. I just want to read out an excerpt from that because they word it so well. Um, so I'll just read this out to you to explain what residential alienation is. Alienation, Marx argued, is not a symptom of existential malaise, but a consequence of the organisation of capitalist economies. Labour is an essential human action. Through creative work, we produce and transform the world. And in doing so, we confirm and realise our humanity and individuality.
individuality. Alienation is what happens when a capitalist class captures this universal capacity to create and exploits it for its own end. When workers sell their labour power to others, they experience what should be a form of self-realisation as something hostile and alien, performed under the dominion, the coercion and the yoke of another man. Separated from their own creative capacities, alienated workers experience their time and their bodies as someone else's properties. But the dehumanising conditions in which so many people toil are not caused by immutable natural laws, they are political economic creations and they can be changed. If we apply these ideas to housing, this, the causes and consequences of crisis come into sharper focus. Whether we dwell in caves or condominiums, housing is a universal human practice. Home is an extension and expression of our capacity to create. It takes an infinite variety of forms, but making a home for ourselves is an essential and universal activity. Residential alienation is what happens when a capitalist class captures the housing process and exploits it for its own ends. Hyper-commodified housing is alienated housing. It is dominated by people who do see dwellings through the eyes of an investor interested in profit or a technocrat interested in control, instead of seeing it as a social right. Commodified dwelling space is not an expression of the residential needs of those who live in it. It is determined by landlords, subleases, management companies, real estate developers, banks, bailiffs, and bureaucrats, by the ensemble of social roles and institutions that prop up the seemingly inhumane laws of housing markets and contemporary society. So that excerpt there just gives you an idea of uh, where Madden and Marcuse are coming from with this concept of residential alienation, obviously drawing on Marx's understanding of alienation. What they're essentially talking about is the commodification of housing, when housing shifts from something that is uh, a form of shelter and a need to something that can be profited from. This commodification creates precarity, insecurity and dispowerment, as well as displacement, dispossession, and it exacerbates inequality. It's important to note residential alienation isn't just a symptom of an exceptional moment during a crisis, which is a lot of the discourse around housing today tends to talk about it just being a recent phenomenon. It's definitely got worse, but it's really uh, to do with the place of housing within our current um, political economic system. So residential alienation gets worse as housing becomes more and more commodified and as, as housing becomes more responsive to the needs of capital and less responsive to the uh, actual social needs of the residents in the space. So we will, um, I will refer back to, to those concepts there throughout this lecture, but next I'll just move on to look at the history of housing in New Zealand. And it's really important to understand what's gone on in New Zealand's history. I've split this up into three sections, pre-1935, where there was kind of a residual intervention from the government. 1935 through to the 1990s, a social democracy period, and then post-1990s, where there's a neoliberal third way era. Um, and it, and I'm aware that, you know, neoliberalism started in 1984, but particularly around state housing, it was really 1990s that, that neoliberal logic kicked in there. So I will get to that soon. So pre-1935, where there was residual intervention from the government, the, these policies were just... They didn't really work, to be honest. These are the major policies pre-1935. That immigration barracks was just crude, cheap, basic housing for settlers who were arriving in New Zealand before they then moved on and found a job. Um, they were, were pretty average um, from what I read, and there were behavioural expectations there. Apparently, the new workers liked to have a drink or two. Um, 
and yeah, but the other policies were, were largely ineffective, apart from that railway housing policy near the end, um, and that was more just simply to house railway workers rather than kind of create housing for the market. But it was in 1935 with the first Labour government where we started to see a massive change in housing in New Zealand with uh, a, a huge state housing scheme that started. And it was part of a wider uh, plan to slash unemployment and stimulate the economy. It aimed to give jobless a trade, boost manufacturing industries, raise New Zealand's housing standards and give tenants a, a form of security um, or a security of tenure, sorry, equal to home ownership. So in 1939, they'd already got up to the point where 3,000 state houses were being built each year, but then the problem was that the war hit. Um, so there was limited demand, limited materials, and limited workforce. 1945 to 49, there were up to 4,000 state houses added each year. So that was a huge amount considering the population. Uh, if you think about what we're doing at the moment, it's around two and a half to 3,000 being added on to the total stock. So 4,000 a year at that stage was for that number of people living in the country was, was really quite impressive. So that's what that first Labour government delivered. What was so important about this is it really normalised and embedded a, a huge state housing scheme. So moving on to still in that period of social democracy, they basically forced the National Party to continue building state houses at a, quite a rapid rate. Um, National did come in and change a few things around. They started to sell off some of the properties which in itself, because they were building so many, was not such a bad thing. Uh, as long as you, you're pumping out the state houses and keeping a, a big supply of state houses when you, you're selling them off so people can become homeowners, um, it's not, not that much of a bad thing. And this was when the Kiwi Dream really started to, to become normalised in New Zealand as well. Um, the National Party made a few minor changes, introduced income limits and started aiming at more at hiring um, lower income earners. And then uh, Labour got back in 57 to 1960 and the housing developments continued. During this time, the housing that was being built, they were basically just building new suburbs. There's so much housing going on and, um, and it was really giving the working class, of, you know, that... Um, stability and security of home ownership. It was becoming a reality for them. Um, the 1970s came and Housing Court New Zealand was established. And by this stage, housing wasn't seen as such a big issue, uh, not as it was pre-1935 and not as it is today. And other issues started to come to the fore there was the protest movement. Um, there was urbanisation, particularly urbanisation of Māori coming into cities, and that uh, created a lot of instability around housing. But generally, the, the housing supply through state housing in previous decades had put the country uh, in a good position. Social democracy was starting to stumble along at this stage with the uh, Britain joining the... Um, the uh, returning to Europe more in terms of the economy and we didn't uh, we weren't able to export so much and there was also the oil crash and there was also a shift towards identity politics as well uh, through the rise of these protest movements so um, politics began to become a bit unstable during that time now moving on to the um, the neoliberal period uh, it, with that fourth Labour government, they, they kept building state houses, but they, they did introduce a few different things. They introduced income-related rents, um, so those who were working would be paying more. But it was in 1991 that the screws really got turned on working-class people in state houses. Um, unemployment and other benefits were substantially cut, and market rents were introduced for state houses. In some cases, this resulted in a tripling of the rental costs overnight, 
for some people. And then on to the 2000s, you've got Helen Clark's government there, where she really um, helped cement neoliberalism in the form of third way, where it's kind of neoliberalism with a bit of window dressing, kind of what we're seeing these days as well. Um, she returned um, from market rents to income related rents. 2004, the accommodation supplement became a big thing and that was part of the working families tax um, package. Now, uh, accommodation supplement has become a bit of an unruly beast, to be honest. It's, uh, last year it was costing 30 million a week and that is up to around 1.7 billion per year for accommodation supplement. So that's accommodation supplements, it goes to the renter and then obviously straight into the pockets of the landlords. Um, 1.7 billion a year is a huge amount for us here in New Zealand, but that's only the tip of the iceberg because you've also got unemployment benefits, you've got pensions, sickness benefits, working for families, all of these benefits, a lot of them end up in the pockets of landlords. And so, yeah, the, it's, it's a major problem. And then 2014 was the national government. They had this interesting idea called the Social Housing Reform Programme. What their idea was was to take state housing and offload it to community housing providers. Their aim was to degree, decrease kind of orders stock from uh, 68,000 in 2015 to about 60,000 two years later in 2017. So they wanted to get rid of 8,000 houses, um, but they, it failed. Um, in Tauranga, they were able to offload some stock onto community housing providers. These are just community organisations. Um, and um, but they tried it down in Invercargill, nobody was interested. They were going to do it here in Christchurch, but then they lost the 2017 election. So that, that whole idea of offloading state houses onto community housing providers, it's basically trying to, the government trying to absolve itself of responsibility, hand it on to community housing providers. Um, and yeah, it, it failed. And then 2017, Labor got back in and they, their main policy was KiwiBuild. Again, another massive failure. Uh, it, it's quite, quite remarkable how, how little they have built. The aim was to have 16,000 houses done by May 31st last year, and they'd only have 1,058. So they, they weren't even close. Um, and they've since um, gotten rid of their targets. And um, yeah, it's been, well, you can't even say it's been scaled down because it never scaled up to begin with, so <laughs> there you go. Um, but the problem with, the problem with KiwiBuild is, is it's essentially a market solution. And it's, the, it's like a, a building company offering 10% off houses. That's all it really is. Um, and a lot of people just can't afford those houses and they didn't take on responsibility of building it themselves as well. The government's got the, the capital, the power, the resources to be able to build at huge scale. Remember, 4,000 back in 1939, imagine what they could do now if they really wanted to. So um, the, the, the problem with Kiwi Build is that it's nothing like a major state housing scheme, but, but then it gets worse because to a lot of people who may not pay much attention, they imagine Kiwi Build as state housing. They think that, oh, this is the government getting involved in housing and look how useless they are. This is never gonna work. When really, they, it could be a, a lot, lot better. So, so um, yeah, it, it's been a, a really, really poor outcome there. So that's a quick overview of the history of, of um, housing in New Zealand. I just wanted to present this graph here. You can see the blue line is the builds. This goes from 1938 to 2002. The red lines is when the uh, housing has been sold off. So you'll see at the start here, first Labor government, they were just building, they weren't selling. They were just uh, building a lot of state houses. And this is what, this here is what I mean by that fourth Labour government. 
is that even though it was neoliberal, and I'm not defending them at all, um, but I'm just pointing out at least they built a lot of state houses during that time. Um, and this graph here um, is, is similar. So this shows the total um, state housing stock from 1938 through to 2010. And um, you can see it's gone up. So during this period, those blue lines there are the national governments and they were still building a decent amount. And, and that goes back to that first Labour government really changing the dominant ideology within New Zealand and forcing the opposition to, to copy them. Um, now public housing today, this is going to get confusing, but just bear with me. Currently there's 73,847 public houses. Public housing is the term preferred today. Of these, um, almost 64,000 are state houses provided by Kainga Ora, just under 10,000 are community houses provided by 59 registered community housing providers. So the government has claimed, claimed last year they added 8,000 8, additional public housing places since they came into power in 2017. But of this 8,000, Kainga Ora has built just under 5,000 houses but also demolished 3,000. So it's, it's kind of they've added 2,000, really. Um, they purchased just over 1,000, they leased just under 600, and they transferred 900 to Iwi. So it all adds up to about 2,810 new Kainga Order housing spaces actually built. Um, in that time as well, the community housing providers have added over 5,000 additional housing spaces, 1,000 new builds, 8, uh, 895 transferred to Iwi and 3,022 are rented from private landlords. So you'll see those community housing providers that have come into the game, they're actually renting them off private landlords as well. So in effect, doing very little to discourage investors. In fact, I would say that encouraging investors because those investors can then rent it out to community housing providers. All the risk then goes on to public uh, funds, the, the government, and, and they just take the profits and, and the capital gains. Now, yeah, so as I said, that's very confusing because these all of these community housing providers come in. So you'll see politicians debating how many is actually being built, and they'll be throwing numbers at each other, and, and nobody really knows what's going on. Um, but what, what is really interesting here is right at the top there, 73,847 public houses. That's the latest uh, number I could find. So 73,000, let's just go back to... Sorry, that graph there. You'll see here, 1990, we really maxed out at about 70,000. So in three decades, we've managed to add about 4,000 state houses. And that shows you how poorly we've done in, under neoliberalism and adding more state houses. Um, the other thing I do want to point out is a claim that Labor makes and that they're building the most amount of state houses since, they're adding the most amount of state houses since the 1970s. Well, what they're talking about here is this number here, um, 3,000. They're building about 2,500 to 3,000 per year, or sorry, adding it on, I should say, uh, about 2,500 to 3,000. So that's the most since the 1970s. However, if you look at the population rates and you go per capita, how much they're adding per capita, they're not even adding as much as that fourth Labour government. Rogernomics, neoliberalism, even they were delivering more per capita. So that's kind of the state of play at the moment, and I hope all that makes sense. Um, but yeah, so, so just, just to sum up the history of housing in New Zealand, some key points. The market has never delivered housing in New Zealand, and I know that's not going to be a surprise to a room full of socialists, but um, most New Zealanders would be surprised by that. But a lot of people say we need to get the housing market working again. 
and you, you can ask them, when, when did it work? Uh, it never worked before. So, um, th but this is one of neoliberalism's greatest achievements, that it whitewashes history and it, and it completely changes what, what history was. Uh, the other key point there is that there's been a shift towards commodification. So this is particularly in the last 40 years. This is why residential alienation is so rife. This is why people have lost their ontological security and um, housing is more of an investment. And also the broad economic ideological changes defined housing outcomes. So current issues. Um, we look at homelessness. Um, the 2018 census data was, those numbers were crunched by some University of Otago researchers. They found that 3,624 people were considered to be living without shelter. So that's on the street or in improvised dwellings or in cars. So that's three, over 3,500 in 2018. Just under um, 8,000 people were living in temporary accommodation like night shelters, women's refuges, um, transitional housing, campgrounds, those sorts of things. 30,000 were sharing accommodation in severely overcrowded conditions and uh, 60,000 were living in uninhabitable housing which was lacking basic facilities. So in total you're looking at 2% of the population is considered homeless. And that definition of homelessness is quite broad. Uh, it takes into account, you know, living in uh, homeless shelters or even overcrowded. If you want more info on that definition of homelessness, Stats New Zealand um, has one. It's easy to find. Now, the public housing waitlist is another massive issue at the moment. Here's um, some numbers. 2017, it was at 6,182. Three years later, it had gone up from just over 6,000 to 21,415, and now it's at 26,868. So it shows how high that has gone up. Um, and um, But to be honest, the, the public housing waitlist is not a good measurement of homelessness. A lot of people simply assume that measures homelessness, where it's not really like that. Labor do make the argument that people have come forward and requested public housing since the government's come in. And, and I think there's an element of truth to that, mainly because when Jacinda Ardern got in, she was talking big and she was going to solve this and do this and transformative change and all of that. And so people thought, well, maybe it's worth going to the government for help. And then they realised that, no, that, that's not going to work. Um, but um, regardless of how accurate it is, it's, it's still an embarrassing number. The other issue around public housing is antisocial behaviour, and this has come up a lot in the news lately, that there's antisocial behaviour. This is, and so again, the problem with this is it leads the public to believe that state housing or public housing fails, and that it's full of problems, and it just creates more problems. It's actually a failure of the market that's led to this. And, and this is why there's, as I showed, there hasn't been enough state houses built in the last 40 years. And so what happens is those most in need get placed in housing. And those most in need tend to be have a whole range of issues going on in their lives. And they could have gang links, they could have severe mental health untreated, drug and alcohol abuse, all sorts of things where they can't really live in complexes and things like that. And so they're the ones who are getting into um, public housing, and they're, at the same time they're building more complexes, so they're living on top of each other, and this is just a recipe for disaster. So the problem here is not public housing at all, it's a lack of public housing, and it's a failure of the market has caused this problem. Um, and a lot of people suggest evictions, well evictions could work temporarily but then they would reapply for housing and then get placed somewhere else, so it just moves the problem around. Um, the other thing is that um, w w there's been other issues going on that has impacted this, the deinstitutionalisation of mental health support within New Zealand over recent decades. 
has left a lot of people with serious health conditions really struggling to live. And when they're crammed in in complexes, it's it's not going to work, and it's not working. Um, okay, the uh, the next current issue is quality housing. Quality, we all know New Zealand's notorious for poorly uh, constructed housing, uh, single glazed windows, things like that. Part of the problem here is that the houses in New Zealand, a lot of the housing stock was built decades ago and it was designed uh, to be heated by a coal fire or a, a wooden, a, you know, wood fire. Um, and coal fires would heat a house like that, but you, you get rid of the fire and then you stick in a heat pump and it's just not gonna work. And so a lot of our housing stock is really difficult to heat, costly to heat, cost of living's going up. So we have what they call fuel poverty, where you just can't heat the house. And, and so this is largely driven by um, environmental clean air rules that came in and we had to get rid of fireplaces. And so that's great that we've gotten rid of a lot of smog in the cities. Um, but it's, 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 it's good for people who live in a near new property with double glazing and really good heating inside. It's not so great for other people living in damp, cold, mouldy houses. There was a recent article from Bernard Hickey um, on his Substack, and he pointed out, he, he pointed to some research recently from March this year of uh, just over 3,000 households. It showed 42% of households were worried about dampness in their home. 8% all stay in one room and only heat that room. And 16% um, of the respondents went to bed early during winter just to keep cold. And 12% reported that the dampness was so bad that it was making their children sick. So, um, so this is an ongoing issue. It's um, the private rentals, it was more more of an issue for the private renters than it was for homeowners. But it was only 60-40, not a massive difference. Um, and, and to be honest, with renters, um, I wouldn't expect a lot else from private landlords. Private landlords are not going to spend thousands insulating a home, double glazing it, getting it all up to, to scratch for a New Zealand winter. They're just not going to. They're in the game to make money. And so a lot of the time there's this moralising around landlords and trying to pressure them, whereas I, I take the position where you're in the game to make money, you, I wouldn't expect you to care. It's not like landlords don't care about their tenants, but they're in the game to make money. So um, pressuring them can get so far, but I would rather just look at other options where we don't have private landlords. Um, and... Recent changes around healthy home requirements have helped, but the problem persists. Renters are also at a massive disadvantage with the Tenancy Tribunal. It's a risk to take your landlords there. Um, they, they've changed the laws so that you, your name doesn't come up um, if you take your landlord to the Tenancy Tribunal, but the problem is you can pretty much guarantee the landlord's going to kick you out of the house pretty soon after you've taken them there. And it's pretty easy to do that. There's massive loopholes in, uh, when it comes to renting rights. You can just say that a family member's moving in and you can move in for a couple of weeks and then put it back on the market. Uh, it's easy to get around for landlords to get rid of tenants if they want. So yeah, that, that's a real issue around the quality. Now the affordability, um, same old story really, if you're looking at this graph, things gotten worse since the 90s here. This, what this graph is showing is that um, this is three times the annual income and, and that's considered affordable. That's what they call affordable housing, is that the price of a property should be three times your annual income. That's to purchase a property. So it was a, this was floating around three to four times throughout this um, post-war period when we were building heaps of state houses. Since the 1990s, when we um, focused just on the market, the housing affordability has spiralled out of control. This graph is similar. That bottom line there is wages. 
Um, that second line there is Brent, so you can see it's starting to, to um, lift away from wages, and here is the price of housing, and you can see it's just gone. Um, it's just gone, yeah, berserk. Um, the, now this map, uh, sorry, this graph here is just the same, but uh, you might have seen this floating around on social media, and someone has put in the, the three last government, well, this one and the previous two. And so you can show, you can see here that the results have been really poor. It just doesn't really matter who's in. Um, the results are the same. And this graph is a bit of a kick in the teeth for um, the, the centre-left to often talk about the lesser evil, because if you're looking at the... Yeah, you, you don't want to look too closely at this, because you'll, you'll actually come to the conclusion national's the lesser evil, which... The, yeah. So, um, home ownership rates, uh, these have gone down. That's 1991, it was up at 73.8%. It's down to 64.5 in 2018. Still relatively high, and um, but it is dropping. Now, as home ownership rates are dropped, of course, investment comes in. There's more private landlords. So this data here is from 1986 to 2018. And this was from research funded by the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Enterprise. And um, it showed that from 1986 to 2018, properties in the hands of investors increased 191%. And in that same period, numbers of properties owned by occupiers grew more modestly, around 36%. So in real terms, that constituted 288,000 more properties entering the hands of investors over that period. And at this point, the, um, the investors, they own about a quarter of the housing stock, or 440,000 properties throughout New Zealand. So this is the commodification of housing that uh, Madden and Marcuse were referring to when they're talking about residential alienation and the cause of it. And um, here you can see what's happening at the moment. House prices are dropping throughout a lot of uh, cities that have experienced the sharpest increases recently. So you're looking at Auckland, Tauranga, Wellington, a lot of other places throughout New Zealand. It's starting to drop. And the main cause for that is really interest rates and it's turned off investors. It's also excluded first time, buyer, first time buyers as well because they're looking at what the cost of the mortgage repayments are. And um, yeah, so this, um, and this idea that we can build our way out of the housing crisis, uh, just more market supply. And um, it, it's, it's a fantasy really, because the market's not going to build houses that are affordable to those most in need. They don't build rentals that cost $90 a week for a single person, which is a, what a lot of public housing properties can cost at the moment, or around that price. So the market just simply isn't going to deliver it. Now just looking at the current policy responses, the two major centrist parties, Labour and National, both parties prefer the market as the primary solution, and neither want to commit to a large-scale state housing scheme. Uh, Labour has signalled that they want to, but they haven't delivered so far. Um, generally, they just want to sustain the economic status quo, this third way Blairite neoliberal approach that is, has become so dominant. And the problem with uh, Labour and National is they start to have these meaningless debates, like the NIMBY YIMBY argument. NIMBY means not in my backyard, and YIMBY. Uh, yes, in my backyard, I suppose. Um, this became a, a heated topic, I think it was perhaps last year. And, but it's not going to make a difference whether we're YIMBYs or NIMBYs because we're talking about market solutions here and we've shown that market solutions don't work and, and they're not going to work. So there's a lot of time and energy going into these meaningless debates between these two parties 
when um, this housing crisis has been a product of, of both parties over the last 40 years. And so when they come together and they sign a bill about housing intensification, you should take it with a grain of salt. But if they're both agreeing on something, then it's pretty much guaranteed not to be. Um, the Greens and the Māori Party, both parties foreground liberal identity politics, and, and this can this is a major problem for them to be effective in elections. The Greens do have some good policies, like 5,000 state houses per year. It would be a step forward, at least. Um, and um, But since they're, they're a post-materialist party, they really struggle to kind of get a base of working class people together. And so they're, they're very ineffective at connecting with a lot of voters. Um, and I mean, I voted Green in the past and I might in the future, but I'm also realistic about what they're going to deliver. So I'm not, not meaning to bash them too much, but they are, they, they get sidetracked so easily if you look at what Marama Davidson's done. They formed a, a cooperation agreement with the government. This was after, late, after Ardern ran explicitly against the wealth tax and it ruled out the capital gains tax and basically ran non-stop against the Greens in 2017. And then the Greens turn around and say, oh, we'll do a cooperation agreement. Marama Davidson becomes the Minister of Homelessness or something like this and then she, she you know, ends up muzzling herself and she can't critique and they're just ineffective. It's a very um, problematic party in so many ways in terms of getting stuff done. And the Māori Party are also struggle to really be effective and get broad-based support because they do target identity politics. And they do prefer equity-based solutions, like at the last, um, at the budget last year, there were millions announced to invest in Māori housing. And, but I've researched this and I've looked at it and I can't find where this money has gone and what it's produced and what it's, what it's actually done. And, and this is part of the problem with these equity-based solutions. Equity, an equity approach is essentially a neoliberal approach. It's aligned with neoliberalism. So it's about trying to soften the ill, you know, soften the, the edges of neoliberalism. Now, the other parties, uh, the Opportunities Party, those are at least are kind of interesting with their land value tax. However, they're really going to struggle to get homeowners who, who vote the most um, to yeah, vote for more tax and, uh, in a way, become renters themselves, uh, renting their land in a way. Um, the other thing about TOP, they, they go on and on about being an evidence-based party. Uh, they completely ignore state housing. In fact, they want to offload state housing onto community housing providers. Even after the last national government tried that and failed, and this evidence-based party is uh, ignoring all of that evidence, and that's what they want to do. So, I, yeah, I think that they really need to think about what they're trying to do with, with housing there. New Zealand First, uh, Winston is, I, I really find him amusing, um, but he's, his problem is he pretends to be a pre-neoliberal national party, pre-neoliberal centre-right party, and, um, but he ignores state housing as well. And he gets so sidetracked by cultural war issues. If he was to focus on material issues, he could actually become an interesting politician with some interesting ideas and probably powerful and effective. But he just keeps reaching for that um, cultural war sugar hit and, and he loves it. And, <laughs> yeah, so the... Too nice, he's as corrupt as they come. <laughs> well, as the yeah. fishing industry will tell you. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm just a baby. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, so that's kind of the state of our politics where there's not a lot on offer. And then the other thing is social movements and activism. Organisation like Renters United, they do a lot of good work. Um, they work hard at trying to change the discourse around housing, um, but there's a, it's quite limited in how effective activist groups can be because they often find themselves working within the system that they're trying to change, and they're so ineffective at changing it. They might 
uh, be able to get some tinkering and that sort of thing. So that's the limitations of the current responses. And then if we look at the solutions, the, it's not going to be a surprise to you that I suggest a massive state housing scheme. To me, it's blatantly obvious. It's, we know it's worked in the past. It's actually part of our country's DNA and, and our culture. So I think it would be a, easier to sell than people think it would be. You've got older people who know what state housing was, what it can be, how effective it can be at delivering housing. Um, and, and you've got young people as well who would, would welcome these sort of bold policies. Um, the advantage of a massive state housing scheme is that it undercuts landlords and therefore reduces speculation. Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah speculation in the, in the market. The thing is that with the, the housing supply argument, within the market, it's just not going to, to be effective. But market, um, state housing supply is a completely different ball game because it delivers to those most in need and it's actually an attack on investors. And, and that's the best way to solve this housing crisis. However, for that to happen, we're probably, unless there's some, some meaningful change within some of the parties that already exist, I think we're going to need a, a new political party and we're going to have to look at something like that that promotes universalist non-market solution. So just going back to that, that reading from Marcus and Madden talking about housing, it's a universal practice. We all need housing. And so if we've got these universal approaches within a political party that's based on, on what the working class needs, that's where you can really make effective change. And that's that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. Well, I think we were built on houses. It costs like two thousand dollars. But it can cost less than I think the idea of a tiny house like, seems good, but then I imagine what it would be like to live in a tiny house in a place Well, yeah, imagine having like a non house, like that's pretty great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can't get a car, I'll get a car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. But I'll just move on to the flat. I feel like finding a flat on the I guess it's like easy, but it's like getting in as a group of people is sort of good. Yeah. 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 I just want to be saving money. Yeah. I had one of the fun ones in the winter's position and I decided that I maybe want to minimize my experience on that rather than experience my freedom and individuality. I would yeah. like rather <laughs> not be a major. It's a... It's a yeah. Uh, yeah. Where did you do that? How can you, yeah. how's that possible? Yeah, just, just get a place. Yeah. yeah, it was like a sleep out type place. It was like a little one. Yeah. Was it part of a flat? No, it was, it was just owned, it was built and owned by just a couple who live in a house that was further back on the property and then my place was attached to the garage. I knew someone um, you know, that had their own like, little house on a backyard. <laughs> and it was real nice. Yeah. It was real amazing. It was like a tree that we got. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I got it. I'd be so happy in that house. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't want to think about it just yet because I don't know. It could also be very hospitable and you are being transformed of them so they don't house you. Well, yeah, but like, I do, I'm hungry. 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 I'm
pay the price, aren't we, saying, of um, doing whatever you use with the And the cheapest? Uh, in this month? Just the yeah, luxury of having a Yes. Yeah. So it's living. So it's yeah, not one of them. They could also manage to living conditions and make sure the health and well-being is also like up to standard. Because it, it inherently going to be lower than the poor living standards. <laughs> Uh, then there's just somebody in your yeah. But that's what I'm saying. Most of your parents could see that. And will not buy you a house, but pay the money to have like a sleep out or room thing in their property that is big enough to house something. That's probably the Yeah. <laughs> probably. You'll be like, oh, I could buy you a caravan if you want. And your mum would be like, oh, put it in the back cupboard. Yeah, yeah, two I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. Okay, just, they, well, they don't even have to see <laughs> that. <laughs> That's what I would do. I guess I should probably stop. That's what I would do. I should stop saying that. Is it possible to say that? I've accepted the fact that it's not possible to say Even if I tried to. Um, it's almost like I shouldn't like live such a painful life um, in order to say. Oh yeah, it is. It's working more so it's like not buying the alcohol, buying this fan, uh, fancy food, uh, driving less, so probably more uh, like exercise. I can't, I can't. Or just leaving the house less, just like doing other things to see what can be it's a bad life. It's a bad life. It's a bad life to me. Just to think. Uh, your idea of just getting like, some of the job is a good one there. Uh, uh, I guess the gold was so cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. The main thing. Yeah. What do people think about it? Like, it's too much. I should watch the live stream on my phone and put it in front of it and make like an end for it. Just put it in Oh, it took me like 20 years. Yeah. 
so that's the kind of window of time before they like have money that comes in for the artists to play the level. They do often suck like the own lives as well, so there's like not children as well, there's not a lot of like children that can just be like other things that can occur, there's just like this is a, it's like fossil grinds to commodify my soul and then, you know, and then you can yeah then you can kind of cut down that 20 years to maybe 10 years or something yeah. Yeah. especially like the way you tied it together at the end. And that last phase, of course, uh, for anyone left of 90 degrees is uh, the most important. But two points about um, massive public housing projects. One thing that you didn't mention, and I think it would be significant if we were to try and do it again, or the pleasant government, try and do it again, was that what they had to do was to get the private sector to do the actual building. And that's how Mrs. Fletcher's got off the ground, because they were the bastards that got the overwhelming contract to build the state houses. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is I like the fact that you, and correct me if I've misinterpreted you, you're somewhat cynical about identity politics. Uh, because in my observation, and I'm probably the oldest bugger here, um, identity politics is important for individuals, how they identify themselves, but it's a private and individual thing. It isn't collective, and these problems are collective and political. Um, when it comes to housing, all the media is talking about is coppers, not homes for people, but the property ladder. Right. You don't get a home, you get an investment and then you get a bigger one and you end up with a, uh, in a McDonald's housing or a Collins So, but there are, there are two areas. One is the state housing and the other thing that was done in those days, and my old man was a beneficiary of this, was a thing called the State Advances Corporation. So that... Uh, the state would lend you money at 3% interest um, to build a house. And for a working class person, though my old man was a house painter, uh, with a wife and two kids to feed and house, it was enough. You could borrow enough on the state to build a house. And he did. And brought me and my sister up. So, you can provide for privately owned housing with state intervention. You can provide for public housing, and I approve of the new term if you like the word. Um, but what you'll need to do is to have the public housing constructed by public authorities and not by some money hungry bloody private enterprise bastard. Sorry, don't rant on, but anyway. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I totally agree with your points there. The um, problem with fletches is something that could happen again, and it's just about whether or not the government keeps a tight enough rein on any private enterprises involved in a massive state housing scheme. Um, and I do think that the, um, the, the loans that happened in the past, they could easily be brought back today especially with uh, Kiwi Bank right there. Um, and um, they've had other policies in the past where there were certain benefits that you could claim two years in advance and then use it. Um, so, yeah, so those, those ideas have worked in the past. Yeah, and that's what we could definitely go back to now. Yeah, the, what's been happening with emergency housing is that that's when people are placed in a motel and they're placed there until they're able to find somewhere more stable and more secure. And it's not, it's not easy to get emergency housing. There are quite strict regulations around that. But what happens is um, there's been an increase in it under this current government they have been more lenient in terms of giving people emergency housing. Uh, the last government, there was a document released by the government in 2017 called a housing, it was a housing stock take or something. And in there they showed that according to community groups, the last government was turning down nine out of 10 requests for emergency housing. And that's why we were getting so many people in living in cars back then, where it's not as prevalent today. But um, obviously emergency housing is inadequate. It's you living in a motel. A lot of those motels wouldn't have cooking facilities, things like that. It still costs 25% of your income to stay there. And a lot of the motels, we're not talking about the Ritz. Um, it's, yeah, it's pretty dire conditions. Um, they, and with transitional housing, transitional housing has become a huge focus of the current government. And the, um, yeah, the problem with transitional housing is it's, it's obviously the aim of it, as it's called, is to transition people into more stable housing. The problem is the housing market has become such a basket case in so many places, it's actually become a bottleneck. So the idea around, around transitional housing is that it wouldn't be longer than a few months at the most, but you end up getting people stuck in those places for years. So the, the focus on transitional housing, um, I'm not sure why they've done this, I'm just a, I just think, just make it a state house and you, you get that ontological security by living in it and it's yours and whereas this transitional housing all it does is perpetuate that instability and insecurity and so it hasn't worked if the market was functioning if everything was in favor of the renters rather than the landlords and there was em empty houses on the market transitional housing would be fine it would make sense 
and it does allow for um, like mental health support and other organisations to provide um, wraparound assistance for people and get to know people's needs, link them in with other places that can support them. But generally this focus on transitional housing under this government is uh, it's just a bit questionable and it's just created bottlenecks, so yeah. Hmm. Over there on the other hand, so I'll fill in a little bit of time for a second while people think. Um, thinking about what Sam mentioned, I was in your talk as he, as he said, um, Josiah, around this idea that these are these 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 Solutions are somewhat in our cultural history, our, our, our national character, where you want to put living memory, basically. Um, I just have a wee anecdote of a co-worker who is um, running for community board in uh, the district of where, where they live. Um, and we were talking about uh, solutions to housing questions, and he said he considers himself a, a moderate, a very, very moderate, actually, right? Smack bang in the centre. Uh, and he said, I think there should be one lender in the country and it should be the government and they should lend out at 1% and that should be the only way you can get a mortgage and the government can give that to everyone so everyone can get a house. Mm. And he considers himself a moderate, smack bang in the centre. And I thought to myself, if you did that, mate, you'd be invaded by Australia <laughs> because all of your banks <laughs> would immediately <laughs> pressure the government to, to invade or set up an embargo or something. So I think it's an interesting example, just a totally anecdotal, of someone who's not maybe as much of a political animal as most of the people in this room, but what he considers an obvious solution is extraordinarily radical <laughs> as far as housing goes. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, I've forgotten your name. Uh, Giles. Giles. Um, I was, I don't know much about uh, public housing in New Zealand, so I was kind of wondering what kind of styles of housing are often you know, we've, we've talked a lot about moving towards like higher urban density and walkable cities and stuff like that. But are, are, are the houses that are offered kind of, you know, five-story buildings with multiple kind of people living in the same place, or are they single-story, you know, with a garden that can't be maintained, uh, kind of out in the middle of nowhere where you have to drive into town to, for your job? So I'm, I'm kind of wondering what it's on offer. Are you referring to public housing or the market? Yeah, public housing, yeah. Well, I guess a lot of that public housing is it's yeah. actually market houses that have been kind of rented by the government, right? Yeah, a lot of them have been, but m more recently there has been a shift away from the standalone properties to building more complexes. So you might know out on Brougham Street, there was a huge amount of uh, public housing going in. That's actually uh, the City Council, which is Ōtatahi Community Housing Trust. So they put a lot of housing in there. It's not, it, they're all connected, but it's not a massive complex. It's not something that um, became quite notorious in America and the projects those big massive places um, or even council estates in the UK but um, there are it's more density and, and more people living on top of each other so it'd be within Christchurch you'd struggle to find anything over four stories high in terms of um, public housing um, and I'm not so sure about up in Auckland and Wellington maybe up in Auckland um, yeah, it would probably be quite similar. They, they have been focusing on building more dense housing and getting more places in there, but they're aware of that, the problems that exist from that as well. But, I mean, I think a lot of those problems come from no diversity in economic and cultural and age of the people who are living there, right? Like, if you just chuck all the poor people into one area, then you start to get problems, but... Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, that's why it's become such an issue with the antisocial behaviour, is because there's only a limited amount of places, and they, they house the most in need first, and the most in need could be people who have perhaps, I don't know, come out of prison, got gang links, 
got severe mental health issues that aren't being treated adequately or supported well. And, and then you've got all of these problems exist. So, so the solution is actually just massive amount of supply so that all people aren't crammed in so closely together and they'll be more dispersed. And that's when you'd get a lot more stable neighbourhoods. Yeah. because this is one of the major issues that comes up when you know discussing housing in New Zealand. Um, over the COVID period when immigration was zero, we witnessed the highest increases in housing prices, you know, an unprecedented rise, rise in house, housing prices. How do you see you know the impact of immigration on housing? Yeah, I don't see it as, as the major issue. Supply and demand obviously affects housing, but only to a certain point, um, because if there's, if there's more people wanting to rent or buy a home, then that does allow the prices to go up. But the, the problem with the um, blaming immigration argument is it's really linked to that market supply argument. The thing with immigration is that immigrants come in, they work, they pay taxes, and they have very low rates of unemployment, and therefore their taxes should be there to help fund more housing. So it should be, have a neutral effect. Um, but it doesn't because there's a limited supply of, of state housing and the market's not delivering either. And so when it comes to the, the immigration argument, it was really big and then COVID happened and we shut the borders and house prices rocketed. And so, it, yeah, it, it, it just exposed that argument about how, how limited it is. Um, and so really the supply and demand argument, it should be looking at supply from the state and, and that's where you want to look at the supply and demand issue, I think. I think that generally they've got the idea right at the moment that um, they're still building standalone properties, that they are still building state, um, state housing standalone properties for bigger families, because there's still a demand for families as well. A lot of homeless families in New Zealand, throughout New Zealand, that need three, four, five, or even six bedroom houses, and they are building some. But there has been a shift towards more kind of two-bedroom units. And you see that in the, the market supply as well. And it would also depend on the, um, the places that you're building them. So in the bigger urban areas, I think that there's more uh, demand for the smaller two-bedroom places, two-bedroom or one. But it changes from region to region. So in Christchurch, there's a huge shortage of one bedroom properties in Christchurch. This goes back to post -earth, uh, to the earthquake where the central city was decimated and just east of the central city, there were a lot of one bedroom units in there and bed sits. And so they all got ruined. Um, and so there's a lack of one bedroom places in Christchurch. Whereas in other places, there's different demand. So it's just about being responsive to that demand. But the, the advantage of if you were doing a massive state housing scheme and you were building two bedroom units, you can build them really quickly. And, and you know, and the, um, having so many in one place would not really be an issue if, you, if everyone was living in them, rather than just these people with serious needs, yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Joe. Um, I guess I was just interested that you were talking about the change in um, housing being regarded as somewhere to live 
being an investment. But um, you haven't really, I'll just be interested if you've got to say anything more to say about the relationship between that and financialization of it turning into an investment. Because we particularly, you've got um, mortgages being liberalized, ironically, at the starting from Muldoon in 1976. But certainly, going into the fourth Labour government, there was a lot of liberalisation of the mortgage market, which allowed the, a whole lot of money to come in from overseas, and it essentially was funding the banks to push the, the prices up. Um, so, you know, and I think that's, yeah, that's it, it comes across in all sorts of angles that, ironically, we end up, you know, there's a focus on sort of Chinese sounding names for houses being the problem, when actually it's actually overseas money, not the people, that are often causing the problem. Yeah, it's the financialization, and uh, yeah, I probably could have been clearer, but that's really what I meant by neoliberalism, and and that change, and that's what's happened. Um, that guy, David Harvey, I mentioned earlier, he's written an interesting essay called The Tale of Three Cities, and he looks at the way housing has changed from use to exchange to speculation, and, and it, that's that process of financialization that we're talking about, where it's housing today is a, it's used as an investment and something to speculate on. And Shana Bella Quibb has also talked about this. He wrote a book called Generation Rent. Um, and what that's about, it's not about a generational war thing. It's, uh, it, he's looking more about how things have changed over time and how it is really difficult for young people. Um, but there's, um, and it's around that, that financialization. And within New Zealand, he points out that we don't have, when it comes to investing, there's not much of a share market culture. Everyone just goes and buys a second house. That's what you invest in if you want to invest. And so it's become a cultural norm. There were a couple of, I think, a couple of years ago, Simon Bridges, when he was a leading national, um, there was talk about um, capital gains or something, and, and he said this is a tack on New Zealand's way of life. And what he kind of exposed there was that just investing in property is a way of life in New Zealand these days, the middle class New Zealanders, it's what you do. As soon as you can, you go buy that second property. Um, and, and that's what's happening um, and yeah so it's this is how we've got to to decommodify housing you'll hear people talk about that a lot of the time decommodify and that is to to remove housing and property from from being a thing that is speculated on and it's return it to to more about use and what it's used for yeah. Yeah, I think that the, the idea of satellite towns and then having really effective transport links is a good idea. And, and so it, it shows really how housing policy and transport policy is interrelated and that the solutions have got to come from both. I think the idea of satellite towns is a really good idea, but you need really good, I think, train services. Um, and I would be more than happy to live 50 k's from Christchurch if there were good trains that I could catch, you know, most uh, at most times, and that were cheap and fast. And I don't. I think a lot of people would quite enjoy that because you, you'd be able to live in a rural, semi-rural area, but get into a city centre really quickly. I think that would be quite appealing to a lot of people. The other thing about um, the lack of space in Christchurch, we've got half of our city's a car park at the moment, <laughs> and we, we've got so much space here that we could have, um, we, we could be building a lot of state housing here, and people around the country would be happy to move to Christchurch if it meant they either got 
public housing or th there was affordable housing that they could buy. I think people would, would be willing to move for housing um, because it's become that much of an issue. So yeah, I, I see these problems as easy to fix if you've got a government that wants to do that and wants to make those quite meaningful changes, but they are possible. Yeah. How many houses would one and a half billion dollars uh, a year build? Like, yeah, I'm not too so sure. It's like insane, isn't it? It it's is. like it's throwing a, it down the drain, like what yeah. the fuck? It's a ridiculous amount. And it's, it's simply encouraging it's investment. Solve the, solve the problem in like three years if you just build some houses. <laughs> yeah. Fuck's sake. It's, it, it is a huge thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, Thank you. Um, and it was, a, it was really our privilege to have you along, Josiah, and uh, thank you so much for your time.